It's my, it's my, uh, my great pleasure to announce the Friedrich A. Hayek Memorial Lecture sponsored by Donald and Judy Rembert. Um, Nicholas Kachanowski is a, an Associate Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Free Enterprise at the University of Texas at El Paso. Senior Fellow at the American Institute of Economic Research and Fellow of the USEMA Friedman Hayek Center for the Study of a Free Society. He also serves as Associate Editor of the Southern Economic Journal. Kachanowski is past president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education and a former director of the Mont Polaron Society. His work has been published in outlets such as the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, the Review of Austrian Economics, Review of Financial Economics, Journal of Institutional Economics, Public Choice, and the Journal of Economics, Behavior, and Organization, among others. He is co-author with Emilio Acampo of Dollarization, a Solution for Argentina. Um, he will address us today on the topic of a case for Argentina's dollarization, why and how to implement it. Please welcome Dr. Kachanowski. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, the Institute. Thank you, the donor. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me to be uh, here. As I was talking with Joe, I think my last time here was something like 10 years ago. Uh, so I'm very happy to finally make it back. Okay, uh, I want to split my, my talk in three parts. Uh, the first one is why there are talks about dollarization in Argentina, the dollarization case, if you want. This topic by itself can take us hours. I want to focus mostly on Argentine-specific uh, issues or arguments. The second part is, well, how you do it? And I get that the question a lot. Okay, Nicolás, you talked me into dollarization, but how this happens? Uh, so that will be the second part of the talk. And the third part is what's going on today is there any chance that Argentina will dollarize? You know, what's going on now that Millet, who advocated for dollarization, is president? Okay, uh, why dollarize Argentina? What's going on? If you look at this country, you have decades, a large number of years of monetary mismanagement. We're not talking about just the last 10 or five years of high inflation. Since the 1945, at least, Argentina has high inflation. You have high inflation, volatile inflation with all political parties, with any type of government, which signals to you this is an institutional problem. It's not a matter of choosing the right central bank president or choosing the right government. We always have high inflation. An institutional problem requires an institutional solution. If you look at Argentine history, when you have currency boards, uh, type of monetary policies back in the day, in the late 19th century, in the 20th century, those are the times where you see the macro of Argentina in better shape or not so bad <laughs> as its standard. So when you have strong monetary regimes, this is when things seem to be working a little better. So you have long run economic underperformance. You want to produce an institutional shock if you want to change that overall you know, trend and performance. So let me show you some, some numbers. This is the yearly inflation rate in Argentina since mid 1940s till uh, I think a couple of months ago. It's very volatile, it's very high. Pay attention to the uh, vertical axis and you will see how high those numbers are. If you take that time frame, the average inflation rate is 60% per year. We have, in average, 60% inflation per year for 80 years. Right? The only time where you have inflation more or less under control is the 1990s, which is when we had a sort of currency board. Right, the closest you can think in Argentine history of being dollarized. Other than that, nothing works. Argentina is, I think, the only country you can find that implements the famous and fashionable inflation targeting regimes and fails. Any other country they do that, it works. <laughs> in Argentina, it doesn't. Right? So you have a very deep institutional design problem here. Uh, this has consequences. So here we have, in 18, uh, 1880, until 2016, the ranking worldwide of income per capita in real terms. Uh, for a number of reasons, Argentina likes to compare itself with Australia. Similar, uh, uh, similar weather, similar you know, agricultural production, and so on. And Australia is a country that Argentina likes to compare to. We want to be like Australia. That shady area, if you are in there, you're in the top 20% income per capita worldwide. That's Australia, right? Flatline. Always doing pretty well. I'm going to plot Argentina. It did pretty well, 
uh, once the country becomes, you know, geographically solidified in 1880s, and at some point in 1945, if I remember the year correctly, uh, Peron decides to change the constitution, and that becomes an important institutional shock, and you start to see Argentina falling in the ranking. You have a downward trend. It doesn't matter what you do, you have a downward trend. Some years you do a little better, like in the 90s, other years you do worse. The last few years is really bad with stagflation. The idea behind a strong monetary reform like dollarization is to change the trend, not just to change how you are doing a few years. And changing a trend requires a big institutional shock. Dollarization is part of that menu. This is more recent. So now we have what's happening in the last 20 years. In the horizontal axis, you have how many of the last 20 years your GDP had a negative growth rate. You are producing less than before. In the vertical axis, you have how many of those years your inflation rate is, ha is more than 10. The farther you away from the origin, the worse, right? You want to be very close to the beginning of the graph. These are all the countries I found information for. One of those is Argentina. <laughs> Which one you think is that? But hey, we're talking about Argentina. This is not Iran, Sudan, Yemen, Zimbabwe, <laughs> Libya. Don't go crazy. That's Argentina, pretty bad. Who is Argentina surrounded? Who's close to Argentina? Iran, Sudan, Yemen, Zimbabwe, and Libya. We are not as bad as Venezuela, but we might be getting there, right, if you don't change course. So if you look at the last 20 years, you have a large number of years worldwide where you have very bad macro performance. High inflation, more than 10%, your GDP is falling. The point of showing this graph, and this is only for my Argentine audience, to realize that you are doing really bad, right? You don't fix it with an aspirin. You need something stronger. Those three, El Salvador, Panama, and Ecuador, those are the three dollarized countries in Latin America. They are doing pretty well. So how you go from there to here? Can you do that without dollarization? That's the underlying debate, or you no know, contention in this debate. What people that advocate for dollarization say is, you need to have a strong, credible institutional reform. Dollarization gives you that. If you cannot do that, if you start a road, it's going to stop like we did so many times before. This is the inflation rate in Ecuador. They dollarized in January 2000. Uh, that year, the inflation was 96%. The next year, it falls more than half to 36, uh, 37%. The year after, it falls again more than half to 12%, and then it remains flat, around more or less US levels of inflation. Even if you have Correa's president, even if you default, even if you are hit by the 2008 crisis, it doesn't matter what happens, your inflation gets anchored more or less around US levels. And we're not talking about you know, a super free economy here. right? OK, so. When we think about dollarization in Argentina, and I want to clarify, dollarization basically means you remove your domestic currency and you adapt a foreign currency as your currency. In the case of Argentina, that will be the US dollar. When we are working on this reform, we try to optimize something with some constraints. Right? We are economists, so that's what we do. We optimize with constraints, I guess. <laughs> so one of the things that this reform is trying to do, and other reforms, Discussing Argentina, maybe trying to uh, maximize something else, like how much the central bank can do. But that's not what we're objective. What we're trying to do is minimize the likelihood that the reform will fail. We are working under the assumption that Argentina has no margin of error. The value at risk, if you put a reform and fails again, and you walk into another crisis, can be really, really bad. So our objective is you cannot miss. You have one bullet left in the gun, the hungry lion is running to you, you cannot miss a shot, right? So we're not trying to optimize what the central bank will do in a new Argentina. We want to minimize the likelihood of mistakes. And that's something to keep in mind when you look at any monetary reform, what is that uh, this reform is trying to optimize? Some constraints for any reform, dollarization or not, the central bank in Argentina is bankrupt. Oops. Uh, you have a lot of central bank liabilities that are backing deposits in the commercial bank. So you need to be very careful how you deal with those. Uh, domestic politics is not only non-credible, they cannot create credibility. Nothing they say will be believable. So how you create a credible reform if you, can, if you are not credible? Institutional anomie. This basically means uh, you, know, you 
pass a law and it's worthless. Uh, Argentina like goes back over their laws and nothing happens like that overnight. So you can declare that the central bank is independent by law and that's meaningless. And we prove that repeatedly. Then there are some political reasons why you may think about dollarization. Uh, whoever was going to be the new government, they were going to take office in a very difficult, to put it in a nice way, scenario. Argentina needs to do a lot of things. Balance the budget, pass a labor reform, open to trade, and you can make a very long list. Those reforms take time to implement and takes time to see the effects. Right? The new government balanced the budget in January and February, and we don't know if that's going to stick until the end of the year. Right? We have to wait and see to be sure. You don't have that time. Before you know it, you are in, mid in, in mid midterm elections. And now your whole you know, incentives change. You need to win the uh, elections in Congress. Dollarization is fast to implement and has a faster impact on the price level. Now you have the political space, the political bandwidth, the political capital, and the incentive to move forward with the other reforms. And this is one of the main reasons why we were advocating, at least I was advocating, that if you want to dollarize, you should do it sooner than later, because if you change this and try to dollarize later, the time may play against you. Okay, so if I put, to summarize this section, the different monetary reforms discussed in Argentina have a central bank independence by law, have by monetarism, which basically means have the Argentine peso and the dollar compete with each other under equal conditions in the market. This is the most popular right now. Uh, have the peso convertible with the Brazilian real, that was a real proposal. Uh, or dollarization, if you put all of those in the table, all of these can be technically consistent, meaning if you start them, they can work in theory, right? They won't break down by themselves. But those three are non credible because they depend on domestic politics. Dollarization doesn't depend on domestic politics and is credible. It's very difficult to undo. And that comes with the credibility component that you need for this to work. So, where do economists disagree on the dollarization topics? I think there are two main issues. One is does Argentina have enough dollars to dollarize? I hope. I will show you in the next slides that you don't need as many dollars as most critics think. The other one is the credibility assumption, whether you think that you can create the needed credibility for other reforms to, uh, to work. If I look at Argentine history, my reading of Argentine history is that that empirical evidence says you don't have that credibility. It's very unlikely that you're going to be able to sustain this in the long period of time other than your intuition and what you can think in the white world was your evidence that Argentina can create that high level of credibility. And that's where most, in these two points, is where most of the debate uh, takes place. Okay. Maybe I open your mind to think that dollarization might be a good idea for Argentina. So how do you do it? Um, Every country dollarizes in different ways. This is not like a one menu fits everyone. I like uh, pizza with pepperoni. You may like pizza with, I don't know, something else. Nothing wrong. But both of them are pizzas, right? So there are different ways that you cook dollarization. The first thing to keep in mind is that you need a dollarization rate. At which rate you change the pesos to dollars. Conceptually speaking, this is your equilibrium exchange rate. Uh, if you are in Argentina and you're paid your salary in pesos and you turn around to whatever you can, your legal market or the black market to buy dollars, this is how many dollars you get once you transform your pesos to dollars. Once you dollarize, you should get your same dollars. Right? Now, what the number is depends when you dollarize. It's not the same if you dollarize this month, next month, one year from now. So no one can give you a specific number because it depends on when you want to do this. But conceptually speaking, you want to dollarize around your equilibrium values. Now, I find it easy to separate what needs to be dollarized in three groups. The first one is bank deposits. This is the one that you can dollarize the fastest. Then you have the currency in circulation, the pesos that people have in their wallets, that store managers have in their stores, and so on. And then you have a very specific Argentine problem, which is a central bank liability. The Argentine central bank has issued a large number of short-term liquidity bills. They are in pesos and they're sitting at banks. You have to do something with that. So I'm going to go through all those three. 
from the fastest to the slowest, which is also the easiest and the most difficult. Okay. So bank deposits, easy. You set your um, dollarization rate, and basically what happens with bank deposits, you swap those uh, unit of account from pesos to dollars. So I log in into my online bank tomorrow, and my pesos were converted to dollars at the uh, dollarization rate. Done. You don't need a lot of physical dollars to do this. It's as if it were digital money. In the bank account, you change the unit of account. When you need dollars is in the case that you're going to face a bank run, which in Argentina is a very big concern. I'm Argentine. I'm in Argentina. And you tell me my pesos are now dollars? I'm thinking that of the bank right now. Right? That's a concern. So I think this is uh, unlikely that you're going to see a massive bank run for a few reasons. One is, okay, let's look at international experience. When Ecuador dollarizes in 2000, they see an inflow of money going to the banks. They had a banking crisis last year, not 20 years ago, like the case of Argentina, and the real interest rate was negative, and money was flowing to the banks. A reason is that dollarization shifts your expectations, but also you go to the bank because you want to use the payment technology of the banks. I need to get paid, I need to pay suppliers, I need to pay employees, so I need to use that, which relates to... Uh, the next point, bank money in Argentina today is transactional. The money in the banks is the money because I need to use to make payments. So even if I take the money away today, I need to put it back in the bank because I need to use you know, the transfers and all that. In the short run, you're going to need small change. If the assumption is you want to take your money away and I want my cash, when I go to the grocery store, I need to pay the shim or whatever, I will need small change which in Argentina you don't have in dollars. The lowest denominated dollar bill is 100. OK, uh, so I need change. I will want to have pesos, because in pesos I can have small change. And I don't mind their pesos, because I know I can get rid of the pesos very easily. I make a bank deposit, they become dollars. I pay taxes. I give the pesos to the government. And when that goes to the bank account, they become dollars. Or I used to buy at the store. And the store manager says, you give me pesos? No problem. I can make a bank deposit or pay taxes. So once you dollarize, having small change in pesos is not much of a concern. It's not a problem. Uh, this reform includes a banking reform. Part of this reform is establishing what we call the Argentine Bank of Reserves, or Banco Argentino de Reservas. This will be in an international safe jurisdiction outside of the government, Argentine government reach, and that gives an extra component of safety to your deposits. And the idea is, if you are the public and I'm the government, it's easier and faster for you to move the money around than for me to grab it if it's outside Argentina. And the fact that you can move faster than me is in itself a defense mechanism. And then uh, banks, if you want to withdraw the dollars, instead of giving you this bag of dollars because you don't trust on any banks, I can give you a Visa card with amount. It's more pragmatic for you to be with a card than a stack of paper bills, and it's also safer for you. Because if I steal your dollars, I can use them. But if I steal your card, I cannot use that. And that's a concern actually in Argentina. So it's also an extra, uh, it's, it's safer for, for people down there. Now, the reform has a way, and this will be uh, more clear, I think, in a few slides, that you can bring dollars to Argentina if you need to. So saving the case that you're going to face a massive bank run, you don't need a lot of physical dollars to dollarize uh, bank deposits. This is not to say this is not something to pay attention to, but there are still ways uh, to deal with this uh, and move forward if you want to dollarize. OK, uh, moving to. Uh, Currency, right? paper money. There are different ways to deal with this. In Ecuador, dollarization of the currency circulation was compulsory. You have nine months to change your sucres to dollars. After that, they lose validity. So the central bank in Ecuador has to go and facilitate for you to change the sucres for dollars. In El Salvador, the dollarization of the currency circulation was optional. The soles the colonists, I'm sorry, they don't ever lose validity. You want to keep your pesos? Keep them. No one's stopping you. If I'm Argentina and I dollarize the currency circulation this way, and I'm the central bank, I may say, I'm not dollarizing the pesos in circulation. I don't have to change them for you. You want to dollarize? What do you do? Make a bank deposit, pay taxes. 
So as a central bank, you don't need to have the dollars to change the pesos in circulation. You can let the private sector dollarize those. For Argentina, given that it's in such complicated situation, you can match these two. And you can say, well, we're going to start with El Salvador way and do it optional. And after a number of months, let's say one year, we're going to see the currency circulation falls below a certain threshold. And if it does, then you transfer to uh, an Ecuador case. And now you have another year, let's say, to change the remaining pesos to dollars. This gives you two advantages. Well, a few others, but two important are one, the central bank is bankrupt, as I was saying before. So now you are delaying for the year or the time you choose and give the central bank time to collect dollars to make that change. The other thing to achieve is that you reduce how many pesos will have to be changed for dollars. So let me show you a couple of graphs. This one is tracking the evolution of currency in circulation in Ecuador and El Salvador. That's Ecuador, remember that they had nine months to change the sucres, and that's the time frame where you see the currency circulation fall into low levels. Then you have El Salvador, where it was optional, and it took around two years for that colonies in circulation to disappear. The remaining amounts you have, it probably bills that got lost, and damaged, and who knows where they are, but accountantly speaking, they still exist somewhere. Uh, this graph is what happened to Ecuador Central Bank once they announced dollarization. So these are your central bank reserves in Ecuador. Right, they dollarized in January 2000, so that's the second line. This line is the currency in circulation in Ecuador, and you see it's going down as they dollarize you know, the currency in circulation. But you don't see reserves going down. Deposits go up. So how they dollarize a big proportion of their currency circulation? As I said before, go to the bank. The money going back to the bank. So the central bank is not facing a loss of reserves. Right? Okay. Central bank liabilities. Um, again, you know, we went through the second part of dollarization, the currency in circulation. And as you can see, you don't need like a massive amount of dollars. Central bank liabilities. This is a very Argentine particular problem. The central bank is insolvent. It needs to be recapitalized. There are different ways to do that. Who owns the Argentine central bank? The government, I guess, would be you know, the owner. So how can the owner of this firm bring more capital to the firm? One is you issue debt. Argentina issues sovereign debt. They sell the bonds. They get the proceeds, send them to the central bank. This is transparent, easy to understand. We can see what's going on. The problem, no one wants Argentine debt. <laughs> so not doable. <laughs> Option two, the Argentine government liquidated assets. A few years back, the government decided to expropriate all the private retirement funds, all your 401ks, IRAs. That's mine now. Uh, Thank you for saying yes to my not question if you are willing to give them to me. So the Argentine government has a big financial portfolio that is sitting at some office, used politically if you want. So one option is to take that, sell it in the market, get the proceeds, send it to the central bank. Again, easy to see, transparent, to understand what's going on. A lot of those financial instruments, you had to deal with them in Argentina. They're not international you know, financial instruments, and the Argentine financial market is like this big. So you cannot sell that in the market. It's too big. The market is not big for you to absorb this. There's going to be a large disruptive effect in the secondary market. So this can be problematic even if you can do it. So what do you do? You go fancy. Structure financial solution. The upside. This is the, financially speaking, best way to go around this. It's the cheapest way. The downside is the most complicated part of the proposal. It makes it confusing. I even had discussion with Argentine economists that, you know, we are trying to talk, how you discount the cash flow in a bond? And we cannot just get around that, right? And this requires using instruments that are not typically present in Argentina. So I'm going to explain this the easiest way I can. I don't want to go into the details because that's boring also for me. But it's interesting to see how it works. It's not that, uh, uh, you know, that crazy. So 
We have the Argentine Central Bank, where you have your monetary assets that will be reserves, very low, and then you have monetary liabilities, that's basically the base money. So we can ignore that for now. We talk about the bank deposit, the currency circulation. We're gonna focus on the orange part. So in the financial asset, you will typically have treasury bonds that you go and sell in the open market, but not in Argentina, because those are non-negotiable bonds. The central bank cannot sell those bonds. It has to sit on them. And so the treasury, instead of paying off those bonds, they roll them over. And they have to stay at the central bank. On the liability side, because the central bank in Argentina cannot sell treasury bonds to withdraw money supply from the market, they have to issue their own bonds and sell them in the market. Those are those liquidity bills I was mentioning before. And that's the, on the liability side, the orange part. So we need to shut down the central bank. This proposal uh, is working with setting down the central bank. We don't want to leave it open. So we need to liquidate this, okay? So the first step, and I'm gonna separate this into steps to make it conceptually easy, we're gonna, the treasury is gonna take those bonds, the treasury is the issuer, and it's gonna swap them for the same amount, hopefully larger duration of bonds under you know, international law, so your typical sovereign bond, and these bonds are never gonna hit the market. These bonds are gonna be relocated in an international trust or special purpose vehicle if you want, sitting there. Now, you want to diversify as much as possible the exposure to Argentine risk in this trust. There's only so much you can do, but we can diversify the cash flow that this trust is gonna be collecting. So the government is gonna send to this trust maybe other assets, and these are an example. So maybe I'm gonna some of the exports, taxes I collect, that was gonna go to the trust, fresh dollars to this entity. Uh, those financial instruments I mentioned the Argentine government has after the expropriation of the private funds, send them to the trust. And now you're collecting dividends and coupons that don't come from the treasury. Uh, if Argentina sells the 5G network, those proceeds can go to the trust. I mean, you can come with examples. The point is to diversify that cash flow as much as possible, so we send that to this trust as well. Now we have these liabilities on the central bank, and they are gonna be re-denominated in dollars, and the issuer will be the trust. So if I'm a bank and I have this short-term peso bill, now it becomes a short-term dollar bill, like a commercial paper, right? So now you can proceed, close down the central bank. Uh, I will have maybe a drink that day, this source of high inflation for years, <laughs> be done. Okay, uh, so once you have that, you can insert some extra tools. Try to reduce the risk of this trust because you have someone who is issuing these short commercial papers who are sitting at banks. You don't want to default those. You need to keep paying them. And now the issuer is this international entity whose income depends on Argentina. So you can add a couple of things. These are pretty common, but to give you an idea of how you can start to play with this instrument, you can have a first loss guarantee. Uh, you can have a backstop facility. So if the market price of these commercial papers of these dollar papers falls too much, someone kicks in and pushes the prices up. This trust defaults, someone comes in and pays for them. So you can to, you start to protect that risk with a limit, but as much as you can. You cannot do this in Argentina. This is one reason why we move this outside Argentine jurisdiction. If Argentina is dollarizing, if you create these you know, additions, then the market value of this instrument needs to increase and you benefit from evaluation upside. Okay, fine, you build this. Now what? Now you have a computer. The computer says every dollar that comes to this trust through all these assets has to automatically be used to pay off this debt that was coming from the central bank. So we have $100 of these central bank liquidities that expired and I collect $20, I pay $20 off, I roll over 80. Next year I get paid $15, I pay 15, I roll over the, next, uh, the remaining amount until I pay off all of them. So as time goes by, those liabilities on the trust start to go down and down and down. Because you have excess collateral, you can use that to attract dollars and send that to Argentina, right? As I was mentioning before, to help with the banks. So once you are done and there's nothing else to be paid off, this automatically self-liquidates, all those assets go back to Argentina. And you just dollarize and created the largest reduction in Argentine debt in history without defaulting. 
they should be exciting for any presidential candidate. Uh, but none of them bothered, so. Okay, so this is the most complicated part of the reform. This is how we go around the problem that commercial banks are sitting on that debt and we cannot default that and we need to find a solution where we don't have dollars to buy them outright. So, as I was saying before, and as you probably know, Argentina is going through difficult times. Argentina is a country with long-term fiscal deficits. That's the case now as well. And you may be concerned that now that you move those bonds, treasury bonds from the central bank to the trust, the government cannot roll them over anymore. They need to pay. And those dollars become the source to start to cancel off the central bank bills. So given that the treasury is in deficit, it's basically in default, you are want to put all that extra expenses on the treasury? How do you deal with that? One of the advantages of going this way is that you can play with the timing of those payments. So one way to deal with this fiscal cost is that you, when you change those bonds at the central bank to the new ones, you impose a grace period. Okay, these are the new bonds, the same amount of debt, but I'm gonna start paying one or two years from now. So you postpone when the bond starts to pay and you buy time for the treasury to fix their own situation. Another way is to extend the duration, the payments of, with the new bonds. So those are your original payments. Now you swap the bonds and you make payments go less per year, but for a larger number of years. Or you make a combination of both. The point is that you have a variable, you, you have this to help the treasury solve their problems without you know, sending them bankrupt <laughs> by doing this. Okay, so how long it takes to do all this? For the public, once you change the unit of account, once you say you are dollarizing, you set your, uh, uh, your uh, dollarization rate, just you're dollarized. Yeah, maybe you have pesos in your wallet, but now your country uh, currency is the dollar. You are already standing on the dollar, done. For the government, might be a little different. You dollarize the bank accounts, that's fast. Currency circulation may take nine to 24 months if you take Ecuador and El Salvador cases as, you know, as benchmarks. Changing or dollarizing the central bank, that can be longer. Maybe you take four years to pay off all those, you know, bills, debt, bonds that the central bank has. It doesn't matter. The point is once you announce your dollarization, that's when you dollarize. What's happening behind the scenes with central banks and so on, it doesn't matter for the public at large. So it's, this is not a long process. Now, when Ecuador dollarizes, I think it, it's announced on a, on a weekend, that Monday, interest rates collapse, money starts to flow to the banks. Right? Probably the government was still trying to figure out how to do this. Right? The announcement itself was a game changer. Okay, there are a number of things that um, needs to happen other than dollarization. Dollarization is not trying to substitute or replace other reforms. Dollarization is not sufficient, but a necessary component if you want to really change Argentina. And it's also gonna help you carry the other reforms. So one of the things we talk about in our book is a bank reform. To give you an example, think of Panama, a very internationally open and integrated financial system. Other things that need to happen, whether you dollarize or not, you need to have other structural reforms. You need to balance the budget. You need to change your labor regulations. You need to do a lot of things, even if you don't dollarize. You need to correct your exchange rate. This happened already, so this bullet is sold. But even if you don't dollarize, you will have to depreciate the peso. That's one of, one of the first things that the new government did. You may need to have a sovereign debt swap or renegotiation. Some of that is already taking place. So all these problems are not reasons themselves not to dollarize because you have to deal with them one way or another. Okay, so that's a summary of how you do this. There are different ways to dollarize. Uh, that's the way that we propose it in our book. Uh, so what's going on these days? Uh, during the presidential campaign, the topic of dollarization became um, very intensely debated. And what we presented this to more than one presidential candidate. Uh, the, current president, Javier Milei, he announced in the, dollarization, in the uh, presidential campaign that he wanted to dollarize. Uh, he said that he wanted to do it following this proposal. 
so it was you know highly debated. Uh, but then soon before he uh, the, the elections, uh, the plans change. And so Argentina is today not dollarized, and I get a lot of questions. It's going to dollarize, can happen, it's not going to happen. So let me uh, tell you where we are now. So you can have, in principle, three scenarios for anyone who was going to be a new government. You dollarize soon, or as soon as you can. You dollarize later, meaning you want to balance your budget first, you want to pass some reforms, and then you dollarize. Or you try to keep the peso alive. Those are basically the three scenarios. And keeping the peso alive can mean different things. You can have different monetary reforms trying to do that. Whatever those are, those are your three broad strategies you can follow. So we know that early dollarization is off the table. So now we are between, are we going to see a later dollarization or are we going to see trying to keep the peso alive? And it's very hard to tell. Because if you look, at least from my view, what the government is doing, that's consistent with trying to dollarize later. It's also consistent with trying to keep the peso alive. So if I follow the facts, it's not sorting out to me what the government really wants to do. Right? Um, there's a, another scenario. If Argentina dollarizes, how can that happen? One scenario, well, they actually do these reforms and they, they dollarize later by conviction. That's what the government wants to do. They manage to do it. They do it. The other scenario, the one that was the most likely for me, and keep in mind, we started to work on this book in 2020, right, way before Millet was even a you know, presidential candidate, anything like that, is that what is pushing Argentina to dollarize is Argentina's economic conditions. Millet can be saying publicly every day, dollarization is the worst idea in the world. It will still be on the table. Argentina has been talking about dollarization for years. So the other scenario is more similar to Ecuador's case. Argentina walks into another very serious crisis because they're not trying to minimize the likelihood of failure, like we were saying in the first slides. And the only way out they find is dollarizing however they can at the last moment. And that's the reason to have a proposal written in the first place. We don't want Argentine Congress to innovate dollarization overnight <laughs> in the middle of an emergency because the outcome may not be the best. So how you minimize the errors of improvisation, have a proposal out there ready to serve as a guideline. That was the initial motivation behind this. So if Argentina dollarizes, my sense is more likely going to be this, like this case. This year, next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, I don't know. But there are not many monetary regime options out there that can function unless you have a very serious, credible institutional reform. OK. Uh, that's what I have. I'd be happy to talk about this or answer any questions I can. Um, thank you for bearing with me. <laughs>